Yeah, well, thanks for coming up on the day before spring break, uh, Dragon Day. It's a pleasure to be here. Always is a pleasure to come to Ithaca and, and Cornell. Um, and uh, I think the title was somewhat self-explanatory. So with a colloquial like this, I mean, it's good not to be too uh, specialised because I realise people come from different backgrounds. So, but chaos, you know, I at Cornell. That. Oh, it's you. Oh, great. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, no, no. So, so Guggenheim yeah. and Hoffman. This is Fuzzy. Oh, no, I read Chaotic Vibrations. Yeah, that's Frank. Frank. Oh, okay. That's a great book. Uh, there's Richard's, one of Richard's books. Uh, Steve Strogatz and Guggenheim and Holmes. And when this was written, Holmes was a professor at Cornell. And then currently, Guggenheim is a professor at Cornell. So, Bring Coles and Newcastle is an English expression that just means to say, you know, there's a lot of coal production in Newcastle, so why bring coal to Newcastle? <laughs> and on Dragon Day. Um, and, you know, I went to a, a seminar at Duke uh, a few months ago, and the guy said, look, I'd appreciate it if you didn't interrupt me because I've got an awful lot of slides to get through, okay? <laughs> <laughs> so I'm not going to say that, so please interrupt me if you have any questions. <laughs> <laughs> so, and there are... <laughs> so I, my first visit to Cornell was in 1980, and uh, I played against Cornell University for the University of Manchester. I, I did actually score a goal, but it's too fuzzy, right? You can't read that. Read it to us. What does it say? Well, it says uh, Manchester registered their final tally at 71 minutes when Laurie Virgin caught the upper left corner of the goal. <laughs> I mean, it makes it sound lucky, but it wasn't. It was a great shot. It was a great shot. All right, so um, hopefully this kind of a cropping is not going to prove to be a problem, right? But so anyway, chaos, chaos. We, I think we've all got a broad understanding of what chaos is, and my perspective is as an experimentalist, and really identifying chaos and characterising it, uh, primarily from its frequency content. So I think we're all comfortable with the idea of Fourier analysis, where you have, for example, a sine wave gives a, a spike in the frequency domain and so on. A typical chaotic signal is broadband. What I'm going to do is I'm going to develop a new criterion, a very simple criterion, to, to establish chaos or characterize chaos, and look at four simple mechanical systems uh, for which we do experiments, and there are uh, videos and so on. And I'm going to distinguish between periodic, I'll use the laser pointer, between chaotic and periodic behavior uh, based on the frequency content and primarily experimental data. Now, the standard way to um, establish chaos really is by computing the Lyapunov spectrum, the Lyapunov exponent spectrum. And, you know, I think most people probably here realize that Lyapunov exponent characterizes the um, uh, uh, exponential divergence of initially adjacent trajectories, right? So an extreme sensitivity to initial conditions. And that's all well and good, but they are notoriously difficult to compute, especially for experimental um, systems, where there's a degree of noise, inevitably. So um, the frequency content, I'm going to argue, is a much better tool. It's faster, it's more robust, more reliable. Um, especially for experimental data where there is noise. So really what I'm going to do for these different systems is distinguish chaos and not chaos. If it's not chaos, I'm not going to further delve into whether it's quasi-periodic or periodic or subharmonic or anything like that. It's just not chaos, or it is chaos, in terms of parameters of the system. So here's some characteristics of chaos. So this is what I'm going to contrast. There's a lot of work being done on chaotic behavior and distinguishing it from noise, for example. Right? But what I'm going to do is distinguish it from periodic behavior based on the power spectrum. Now, of course, a chaotic time series uh, has closed, uh, sorry, has random like trajectories and time series, often a strange attractor, at least one positive Lyapunov exponent, but, but a broadband power spectrum. And contrast that to a periodic behavior that, that um, has these characteristics. So I'm going to look at a number of harmonically forced experimental mechanical systems, compute the power spectra, and show that you can distinguish between periodic and chaotic behavior, just based on that. Can you distinguish between noise as well? Uh, yeah, yeah, uh, I'll, I'll come back to that. So in order to sort of get things 
going. Here's an experimental system. And this is exhibiting chaos. So this is a, uh, a surface that was machined uh, in our, with our uh, CNC milling machine. One million cuts to get this very finely produced surface from a solid block of Lexan. And this is a small ball that rolls on this surface, clearly. This is actually a, a ball from an old-fashioned mouse in a computer. And the beauty of that is that it's a steel ball bearing, but it's rubber-coated. So it rolls quite nicely on this surface without slipping. Let me just play that again. Uh, and what this on the right-hand side <laughs> is there's red and blue trajectories. And they are both started from identical initial conditions. And they lead to completely sort of diverged separate behavior. And it's globally bounded and so on, but, but this, is, this is chaos. And the motion of this ball is being tracked by a high-resolution um, high video camera that's mounted on this frame, so it kind of looks down. So if you take five, this is experimental data, five time series of the X projection. I mean, it's a five-dimensional phase space. X, X dot, Y, Y dot, and force in phase. But if you just take the X coordinate and look at this as a time series, you can see that each time the initial conditions are the same, and it follows the same initial path, but then it diverges, it separates. Right? Now there is some transient behavior to start with, but if you made any small perturbation about any state at any time, you would get this exponential divergence of tra trajectories. So there is a positive Lyapunov exponent. So that's just a sort of clean example of chaos in the mechanical system. I'm going to make use of uh, the spectrogram. So the spectrogram is really the frequency content varied as a parameter. And this was initially developed in audiology. This is time. So this is from Mathematica, the Wolfram Demonstration Project, which is a great teaching tool. But this is a uh, probably the most famous sentence in the history of the world. Anyone know what it is? I mean, you, if you're an audiologist, you might be able to recognize it from the frequency content, but... Well, let me take away our box here, and you'll see. Apollo 11, Neil Armstrong. One small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. So this describes the frequency content of the noise, Neil Armstrong's voice. So this is what I'm going to sort of develop uh, to, to sort of characterize chaos. So here's another video, and this was an experiment I did many years ago, and it's also chaotic. Mm -hmm. and this is a roller coaster, and um, you can let this run for six hours if you want. The natural frequency is close to a second, one hertz, uh, natural period one second. And you take the frequency, you do an FFT on this, and then you get this broad band. So the frequencies are distributed over a wide range. If you change the forcing conditions, and the force in here is just a simple harmonic, it's a sinusoidal force. If you, for example, reduce the amplitude of the forcing, uh, you can get a periodic state, and you do an FFT of that, and so you get these nice discrete spikes. So these are from the same system, presumably the same level of noise, and the difference is that one is broadband and one is discrete. You can, oh, this is a pity, this is, um, this is the, uh, spectrogram, so this is as you change the force in frequency, uh, you look at the spectral content, and this is primarily um, harmonic, and uh, this is a bifurcation diagram that shows the softening spring characteristic, which is a classic nonlinear behavior. You get hysteresis, so if you ramp up, it jumps here, if you ramp down, it jumps down here. So these don't line up, right? So the problem with spectrograms, in a sense, is you can't really superimpose them, you know? But, but so that's why I put one under the other. With a bifurcation, conventional bifurcation diagram, of course you can, you can superimpose the responses. Um, and this is another system, again, just to sort of generate some interest. This is an airfoil. That's actually my reflection there on the <laughs> side of the wind tunnel. And this is a particular type of uh, limit cycle oscillation in the wind tunnel. And I signal to my graduate student, and he taps this, and it picks up 
a coexisting alternate solution response. So again, in fact, there's two regions of hysteresis. So this is flutter. There's the, the, the motion of this airfoil is stable, statically stationary. The next up, it jumps into a flutter. So this is an oscillation. And then it jumps down to a different type of oscillation. And again, if you extract the frequency content, you get a lot of rich behavior. And broadly speaking, this is where the sort of more chaotic light behavior is, where there's a broadening of the energy distributed amongst many frequencies. Right? Okay, so let's go back to basics and <laughs> the, the logistic map here. I think most of you, have, in fact, how many of you are taking nonlinear dynamics and chaos this semester? <laughs> you start with this, right? Very simple map. Uh, it's basically a quadratic. And again, using Mathematica, uh, you can set these, this parameter and show, for example, this type of behavior. That's the frequency content. I'm only really going to focus on positive frequencies here. So this is periodic, and you see that the energy is concentrated in certain frequencies. If you change the parameter again, I can't actually read this because it's slightly fuzzy, but it, it goes into chaos, and that's the response. So this is a discrete map stepping along. And that's the frequency content. So again, contrasting that and that in terms of the frequency spectrum here. One of the uh, nice things about a frequency uh, analysis is, for example, quasi-periodic. This could look somewhat chaotic, but in fact there are only two frequencies, and their relationship between the two frequencies happens to be incommensurate. So there's quasi-periodicity. But it's nicely reflected in the power spectrum. Okay, well, yes. Mm. So this is the concept, right? So I've talked about general chaos and characteristics of chaos. And the, the new criterion that seems to work really well, which I'm going to describe, is the following. If you have a periodic signal with discrete energy concentrations at these frequencies, say, what we can do is choose a threshold, two thresholds. The first one is draw a horizontal line that some fraction of the peak uh, power in a particular in the fundamental frequency, for example. So we draw a horizontal line, and then we count the number of discrete peaks that exceed that threshold. And then we come up with a second threshold that says if the number of peaks is above 10, 20, let's label this chaos. So this is the same periodic signal, but with some noise added. Of course, this is just a cartoon, so this is artificial. But what we want is this threshold to be above the level of noise, because this noise is also going to be acting on this chaotic uh, uh, response. And you can see that there are many dozens of spikes that exceed that threshold. So we set the threshold, in this case 40% of the peak energy, and we count the number of um, spikes that exceed that. There happen to be three here. Here, there are many. So we want to choose another threshold that distinguishes that from that. And I'm going to apply this to a number of simple oscillators. So this is the pendulum. And we're all familiar with the pendulum. That's probably the second example you did after logistic map, right, in your class. So here's the pendulum. It's a second order ODE. This is a double dot, some energy dissipation, and periodic uh, harmonic forcing. And it's nonlinear because of this geometric uh, term. Uh, I'm going to add some noise. So this is a numerical simulation of this equation when the parameters have certain values. So for example, this is a periodic response when g is 1, uh, omega is 2 thirds, and q is 2. So given some initial conditions, simulate it, let the transients decay, and you get this nice periodic state. I've actually plotted x, y, theta dot, just because it gives a nice visual representation, because you know, theta just can keep growing right, without bounds. So the power, the frequency spectrum of this is shown here, where I've added 5% noise, just to sort of sense the noise. So 5% noise has been, just Gaussian noise has been added to the, to the velocity. So you can imagine that happening in a real experiment. This is all simulation. And set the threshold here. In this case, it's probably you know, one-sixth of the peak. I can't actually remember how high this goes. 
and then count the number of feet, so you can see there's three. Change the parameters, so these stay the same, but change g from 1 to 1.2, and you get this chaos, right? You do the FFT of that response, and you can see there are many, many spikes that now exceed this threshold. So we want to choose that second threshold to be somewhere between 3 and whatever, a couple of hundred. And if you do that, you get this picture here. So let me explain this. If you do a conventional Lyapunov exponent computation for this periodic steady state, you get a negative. The maximum Lyapunov exponent is negative. So it's not chaotic. If you do the same for this, you get a positive maximum Lyapunov exponent. So it is chaotic, right? So if you sweep through all these parameters, you now have a grid of maybe 200 by 200, 40,000 simulations, uh, Hue, and I believe this is G, <laughs> of course it's off the screen. Uh, this is what you get where yellow is, is non-chaotic and red is chaotic. So it's highly complicated, right? Just different parameter values based on the sign of the maximum Lyapunov exponent. So this one is here in the red, positive. This one here is in the yellow, negative. And that's the conventional approach. And you can do that just fine because you know the equations of motion, so you can compute the Lyapunov exponents very simply, right? Just by simulating two close by trajectories and monitoring their exponential divergence. Well, if you count the number of spectral peaks, like this new criterion I'm suggesting, this is what you get. And we've only got half of it here, but you have to trust me that they are very, very close. And then if you add 5% noise into the peak count, you still get something that's very, very close. The point is, this is probably um, three times as fast as computing this, right? So that's good. But we'll see later that when it comes to experimental data, very often you simply can't rely on the Lyapunov exponent at all, right? Because of noise, whereas the spectral peaks is just fine. Uh, another ex uh, example, this is the Lorena system, which is probably the third example you looked at in nonlinear dynamics and chaos. And the same thing. So this is three coupled first order ODEs. You can set the parameters to get periodic behavior, discrete power spectrum, negative Lyapunov exponent, uh, change the parameters, A parameter, chaos, which we're all familiar with, broadband power spectrum. Again, we can compute these Lyapunov exponents and plot them in a parameter space here. And this is the equivalent result where you count the number of spectral peaks. Almost identical. And again, this is way more efficient and faster, with no real compromise in quality. Right? Same grid and everything else, you know, is, is normalized. So that's all very well for numerical simulation where there is a sort of a mild advantage to this new criterion based on spectral content. So let's now look at some practical applications, which is really my main focus. So a number of low order mechanical oscillators. Uh, I am going to develop numerical models as well as experimental data to show you that it's, you know, it's, it's well characterized, it's well modeled. And again, uh, distinguish between periodic and chaotic behavior. There's something common to all these systems. They're all harmonically forced. I mean, Lorenz isn't, right? But the pendulum was, and, and these systems will be. And it's easy to change the force in frequencies, so sweeping through is a, is a nice, simple thing to do. So that's, uh, this is the first example. So this is, um, I actually did this in collaboration with Tom Matelski, who's a, a mathematician at Duke. And he had worked on this system, I think it, came from fluid mechanics, but he was interested in how you could have a system where the equilibria could be reversed somehow. And he was doing everything from a theoretical point of view, but it set me thinking, you know, could that be done experimentally? So I came up with this system. So I call this a peanut. So what we're going to have is a ball bearing that rolls in this cavity that's formed by two Lexan sheets that are stuck together with the ball bearing sort of trapped in this shape. And here's a couple of um, SolidWorks designers that I, that I started with. Um, and you can see it tilts. 
So the reason for the tilting, I, I just designed this mechanism. So it tilts once per, uh, <coughs> the angle tilts one period per period of horizontal translation, is that you can see that here, at some point here, these are both at a maximum, they're an unstable equilibrium, and this is stable, but when it dips down, they've switched places. Uh, and then uh, you can mount a video camera, which you can see in the photo, and this video camera then mo monitors the motion of the ball bearing as it rolls around. Okay. So, <laughs> yes. <laughs> see that's zero <laughs> but I, yeah there's something so that's the equation of motion so it's somewhat ugly but it's still only a second order ODE highly nonlinear but you can solve that quite comfortably or simulate it I should say using MATLAB or Mathematica or whatever um, and if you make certain simplifications it's not dissimilar to Duffin's equation right which is probably the fourth equation that you learned in your nonlinear dynamics class. So, so here's the equation, and but basically the two control parameters are really the amplitude and period of forcing, which come into, where is it? I think it's actually off the board. This is um, the energy dissipation, it's that damp. So, and you know, these various parameters are fit from experiments. So here's an example. So here's some experimental time series, and again, you know, it's kind of unusual having a system that's that, that where the path is fixed, right? So you can couch things in terms of arc length coordinates, so s and theta, if you like. But when it comes to visualization, it's actually better to uh, convert that from uh, into x, y, and time. So this is where the the ball is literally rolling in the bottom of one of the little hollows. These are experimental results. You can increase the force in or change the force in and you can get periodic behavior that's not simple. So it does this jog, this jog, this jog, but it's periodic. You know? So as a, as a time series, you can see that that's more complicated. It's not chaotic. This one is chaotic. So there's a random-like nature to the way this ball rolls. This is without tilt, by the way, or a constant angle of tilt. So this is just going backwards and forwards. And this is a numerical simulation. And you can see it's very, very close. So we can characterize the, the dynamics extremely well uh, in terms of modeling. Another thing we like to do in modern nonlinear dynamics is look at phase projections. So again, this is experimental, numerical. That's the periodic state. This is also periodic, but non-simple, and that's chaotic. So the, the theoretical model really does a great job of replicating what the experiment is doing. So let's, here's a video. So this is the non-tilting case. Sorry about the resolution. Can you see the ball bearing? Mm -hmm. We found it easier to actually paint the ball bearing white and put it on a black background for contrast for the camera. Anyway, you run that for a long time, and this is what, oh boy, this is what you get. So you take a point carry section, which I could, I'm hoping you guys know what that is. And this is what the numerical result looks like. So this is the point carry section where you change the phase. So you get this folding, stretching, very characteristic of chaos. And this is what the experiment does. <laughs> yeah. I, you know, I, I guess the, the moral is you shouldn't put any diagrams near the edge of a screen, right? Just in case it gets cropped. And for those two, these are the, the, um, the spectrograms. So you can see that over a range of parameters, it's fairly broad bands. This is where the chaos occurs, and this is where it goes back to periodic. And there's reasonable similarity <coughs> there. Um, but this is the tilting case. So now I switch on the tilting mechanism that I had disabled before. And you can see it tilts as well as going side to side. And there's the ball. And this particular example is chaos. So this ball is rolling around in a chaotic manner. Uh, this is actually the force in that describes this motion and the angular motion. And again, great correspondence between numerics and uh, experiments. So let's talk about the criterion then. 
So this is numerical simulation. This is the periodic uh, response. This is a blow up of that. So set the threshold, count the number of peaks. This is chaotic. Set the threshold, same threshold actually, count the number of peaks. Clearly there are many, many peaks here, only a handful there. Choose that second threshold to be between those two, and then sweep through the whole parameter space. And what you find is, this is the Lyapunov exponent computation. Yellow is periodic, red is chaotic. This is the new, what I call a heuristic criterion based on the frequency <coughs> content. And again, the correspondence is really good. And this was much easier to produce computationally took much less time. But it's based on numerical simulation, where you do have access to the underlying equations. This is for the tilting case, similarly, right? Close correspondence between those two. In this case, yeah, as before, red is chaotic, yellow is non-chaotic. About three times faster. This is the second experimental system. So here's the equation of motion for this system. So it's really, a, it's pendulum-like. There's a, a mass that spins around here. This arm forces the system, and the restoring force is provided by these springs. So you can model this system. So you can see it's pendulum-like, a bit more complicated uh, than you know, the simple pendulum. Uh, and then you can fit. So here's uh, a video of that. So this is the periodic case. So there's the force in, it goes up via the spring, and then this is the, so it's the angle of this mass that's being monitored as the state variable, and there's the force in, and then in that case it was just nice and simple periodic, that's raw data. So uh, based on numerical simulation you can also get non-simple periodic behavior, this simply repeats finite number of spikes in the power spectrum, you can uh, also get that experimentally. So numerical experimental. So these two compare really well, again. I mean, they are single degree of freedom oscillators, right? So it's no huge surprise that you can model that pretty well, but, but still. You can get a chaotic response. So now the forcing is just being changed slightly, maybe. It provides a force, and now, this is rotating backwards and forwards chaotically. So here's a typical time, this, well, let's do the experiment. Here's a typical time series, random-like. Here's the phase projection. Here's the broadband power spectrum. And this is the point carry section, which is a sampling once every forcing period. I, I, I don't want to dwell too much on that. And this is actually the, the, this, right, from different causes. And this is what the numerical simulation does. So again, so, so let's focus on this. Contrast in that frequency content with this frequency content. Okay, so let's do that. So this is the bifurcation diagram. So instead of a snapshot, this is a sweep through a whole range of forcing. This is forcing frequency. Do you change, your stage, change the speed at which you're forcing the system? And this is the bifurcation diagram. So here's chaos, here's some chaos, here's some periodic behavior. You get a nice jump. That's very characteristic. That's a subtle node bifurcation, if you like bifurcation theory. Mm -hmm. uh, and this is a computation of the largest Lyapunov exponent. And again, so here's zero. So wherever this line, or well, this response goes above this line, you should have chaos. And you can see you pretty much do. Occasionally you get a periodic window embedded within the chaos. That's something that's quite familiar to us. But that's based on numerical simulation of the equation. Here's the frequency content, and you can see that we get basically periodic behavior with some higher harmonics, and then this broadband chaos. So what we really want to do is, is compare the, um, this new criteria. So here it is. So really, you kind of have to flip back to the bifurcation diagram. Sorry, this one. And what happens is, along this frequency, the number of peaks fluctuates. So it can be high, a high number where there's chaos, or a low number where it's periodic. So we want that other threshold to be somewhere here that cuts off 
and distinguishes between chaos and periodicity. And you can see it's fairly clear, isn't it? It's a fairly clear cut distinction. Well, this is four different examples of where to set that threshold. Now, blank is really where you're basically at the, um, on the axis, which means that even though it should be able to distinguish between periodicity and chaos, it, it can't because it's at the noise floor, right? So it can't handle that. But as soon as you go to 1%, you get blue, and you can see that now the periodic state jumps down. Red, 5% green, so it, it does a really good job providing you're sort of slightly above zero, which is kind of surprising when you consider there's noise and so on. And you can actually, for specific cases, you can vary the cutoff cut off threshold as the number of peaks. So here, this is periodic. Right? I really should have superimposed the bifurcation diagram, but it's in here where it's periodic. And you can see that the number of peaks drops off very quickly with the cut off threshold. Whereas in chaos, it takes a long time. So clearly, you can choose the number of peaks and the threshold to distinguish between chaos and periodicity. And here's the result. So this is the conventional Lyapunov exponent. That happens to be the the parameter value that, that I did the bifurcation diagram, you know, some sort of inter intermittent chaos, periodicity, chaos, back to periodicity. This is the heuristic criterion based on numerical simulation of the equation of motion, which compares very well. This is the experimental, and, and that's probably the most important result that I'm displaying, but we've lost <laughs> a good chunk of it, unfortunately, because of the projector. And that's the numerical simulation at a low resolution that's the same as the resolution of this. Now, what you've got to realize is the resolution is a problem for experiments because if you divide this into a grid, you know, even 100 by 100 is, what, 10,000 experiments. So, you know, it is challenging. Uh, but you can see the same general shape is really very well captured. The point is, if you tried the up and off exponents, for the experimental system, you really don't get answers. Right? Even though it's low noise and a clean signal, it's really not, not, not a good response at all. OK, third system, this is a nice snap through. Tim, you did a snap through paper once, didn't you? I remember that. <laughs> so this is a snap through yeah. system. Here's the equation of motion, really quite complicated. Um, and uh, let's take a look at this. I've got some videos. So it can exhibit periodic behavior. So it's being forced in this direction by this spring. And you can see it's a nice, simple, periodic response. Of course, it's off zero, because I've just zeroed the things to be you know, in the st state straight configuration, which is an unstable equilibrium. It's stable here, so it oscillates nicely. Numerical, experimental. Change the parameters slightly, maybe. And you can get this snap through behavior. So again, that's harmonic, well, periodic, not necessarily harmonic, and numerical experimental. Change the force in free. I'm just noticing for the first time that these are radians per second, whereas the other results have all been normalized. So anyway, uh, change the parameters a little more. And now you get a periodic behavior that involves snap through. Hmm. All right? It does like two jogs here, three here, two jogs here, two, and that's the uh, that's the numerical, uh, and this is experimental. In fact, there is some slight difference. Can you see that? That does two, three, two, three. This does three, three, and I think the reason for that is because numerically there's a nice symmetry in the underlying equations of motion, whereas experimentally you can never get pure symmetry, right? So you always get some sort of small bias. And then finally, change the force and frequency again. I hope you can see this at the back. And then it goes into chaos. So here's the time series for the numerics. Here's the time series for the, this experiment. And the way this data is measured, can you see that point there? Again, the video camera is following that point and converting it into an angle. So, looking at the uh, sweep of parameters, not just spot checks, this is a bifurcation diagram based on numerical simulation. 
this is the experimental equivalence. You can see it's, it's pretty good, you know, there's periodic behavior here, here, the two minima, the two e stable equilibria are out here and here. This is the unstable equilibrium. Now, so this is snapped through in the middle, this blue color, experimental numerical. What's interesting though is if you blow up the experimental bifurcation diagram, you do get periodic windows embedded within the chaos, which is exactly what you know you typically expect. You know, periodic windows embedded in the chaos. And here's uh, that's experimental, that's numerical. So again, good correspondence for certain parameter values. So based on the numerical simulation of that equation of motion, again, you can extract the frequency content. Here's the periodic signal. Here's the chaotic signal. And those two come from here. So this is the Lyapunov exponents over the, for the range of force in frequencies. If it's negative, this is the largest. If it's negative, it's periodic. If it's positive, it's chaotic. And you can see, yeah, I mean, sometimes it gets kind of complicated where the degree of chaos, if you like, fluctuates over this area. This is the peak count, this new criterion that I'm trying to push. And it's much clearer. So this is periodic, this is chaotic. So there's a much bigger dichotomy, if you like, between chaos and not chaos for the peak count content of the, of the frequency as opposed to the conventional Lyapunov exponent. And um, that's numerical data. And then for experimental data, same thing. Of course, there aren't nearly as many points because you know this is very time consuming experimentally. But the point of this picture is to say, yes, with Lyapunov exponents, these should be negative, but they're not. And sure, where there's chaos, because going back to the bifurcation diagram here, as opposed to here, yeah, I mean, it, the Lyapunov exponents are larger, but there's no clear difference between positive and negative, is there? Whereas the peak count criterion is pretty much clustered at zero for periodicity, and then it bumps up to this relatively large value here, where there's chaos. However, <laughs> this bifurcation diagram is based on a pure sweep up. So you have a control parameter, so you just gradually increase it. Well, there's more to life than that, of course, and this is what you really have, where you increase the force and frequency, then you sweep down, then you jumble the initial conditions, and this is actually what you get. So there are many frequency ranges where there are actually three coexisting attractors. You can't extract three coexisting attractors just by sweeping up and sweeping down, right? You get one, two, but you have to jumble the initial conditions and find out what's over there. So I'd argue that this, this diagram shows you one of the drawbacks of continuation or path following, where you're sort of blinkered and you're just following the particular path that you're on, but there's this other stuff out there that you can only get if you think uh, large perturbations and sort of get out there. Okay, so just coming to the end then, uh, what about continuous systems? So this is a project I did at the, um, at the Air Force lab in, um, in Dayton, Ohio. So this is uh, reminding you of that snap through one degree of freedom system, what it looked like. If we now go to a continuous arch that is liable to snap through, uh, you can get a system that, here's an experimental video, and it's not so easy to see, but um, this is oscillating, and in fact this video is really showing coexisting attractors, so this video was for another purpose. This is my graduate student, Richard Reed, who uh, is actually now an assistant professor at the University of Washington in Seattle. So um, you can perturb this system. This is chaotic. It's a continuous system, though. So it's high order. It's not a single degree of freedom system. You can do a finite element analysis of this and use the same criterion, and this is what you get. This is incredibly numerically intensive. Right, to extract the frequency content for a continuous system by, by doing a finite element analysis, spatial discretization of this. But what's remarkable is, isn't that similar to this? This was the simple, discrete, snap-through model. This is a continuous elastic arch that also snaps through. But in the parameter space of force in frequency against force in amplitude, 
And using this new criterion of spectral content, they're almost identical. Right? How do you pick that amplitude? Pardon? You know, in the continuous system or your finite element model, how do you pick the amplitude? Yeah, just a, a one point. So we have a laser. In fact, mm, we actually took data using DIC. Are you familiar with that? Digital image uh, control. It's like st uh, stereoscopic vision where you have two cameras and it actually gives you a 3D. But we also use the laser. Can you see there's a little red spot there? So you can really choose the response to be anywhere. But, but like in continuous systems, you want to avoid nodes and things like yeah. that. So you, you, you want something that represents the... Well, you have to find a degree of freedom that has all the juice. So you yeah. can make your... Exactly. So, you know, we try different things. Here's the peak count. Now, I'm, I doubt if that shows up at the back there. But for this, if you sweep through here, it's periodic, and then it goes into chaos, and then back into periodic. Here's the peak count. You can see it's effectively zero. There's a small, finite number of peaks for periodicity or non-chaos. And then it jumps up, and this is where all the peaks, so the spectral content suddenly broadens, and then it jumps back down again as you exit this. And this is another example here, and you really can't see this, not just because it's cropped, but because it's just not very clear. But you get almost zero during the periodic phases, and then it jumps up to chaos. So um, that was pretty good. All right, summary. So you can read this, but um, this counting, a simple count based on two thresholds. You know, the first threshold is the uh, proportion of the maximum energy in any one frequency. And the second threshold is how many, literally how many spikes exceed that, gives a surprisingly accurate me measure of chaos. Uh, in parameter space. So if you just want to distinguish between chaos and not chaos, this is really the way to go. It's simple, uh, and it's certainly robust in the presence of noise, which Lyapunov exponent computations are not. And, you know, we're kind of familiar with frequency analysis, aren't we? FFT is, is a very routine thing. No one writes FFT codes, do they? I mean, you just push a button. It's a very standard tool. Um, of course, none of this really handles sensitivity to initial conditions in the sense that you could have multiple coexist in attractors. But that's a problem for Lyapunov exponents as well. So the major conclusion is that this ad hoc criterion is about three times roughly more efficient if you have the equations of motion and you're doing numerics. If you have experimental data, it's way better. <laughs> because usually Lyapunov exponents just can't be computed for experimental time series where you have noise. And after all, these experiments are not exactly noisy, are they? They're not like biological systems with you know many degrees. These are relatively simple, low-order mechanical systems with a pretty good signal-to-noise to ratio. Uh, so you should think that Lyapunov exponents would be relatively easy to compute, but they're, they're not, whereas this ad hoc criterion is really pretty uh, surprisingly good. And so we wrote this up and it was um, appeared in, in chaos a couple of years ago. And that, uh, that concludes my presentation. We'll give a chance to ask questions. We got one behind you. Sorry, I'm behind you in the market. <laughs> so what's magic about number B? It seems like in all of those examples, it was a factor of B more efficient. <laughs> oh, that's very rough. No, yeah. But so, are there examples in which you get a factor of 30? Uh, Is that a function of the number of degrees of freedom? Yeah, yeah, that? certainly. But so, at a very sort of basic fundamental level, if you have the equations of motion, uh, you can simulate them, get a time series, you can extract the frequency content from that time series. If you want to compute the Lyapunov exponents, you have to have like a master trajectory, and then you have to have the variational trajectory that started very close to it. So at a minimum, you have to do twice the work. Another problem is with Lyapunov exponents, um, if you just have data, you have to use nearest neighbors. 
right? So you generate all this data, and you effectively have to wait until your trajectory comes back to a close vicinity of that of a previous point in the full phase space. And that phase space you have to reconstruct using time lag embedding and all those different things. Uh, if you're lucky, you can find two, two trajectories that are close by from data. Interesting. So this way, it is actually a functional dimensionality. That certainly comes into it, yeah. yeah. Whereas with the ad hoc criterion, it seems you just have a time series, right? So you measure one variable, and the characteristic, the frequency characteristics of it. Whereas the Lyapunov exponents, you really have to go through a lot of work. And I mean, Lyapunov exponents is more formal in a sense because it does, in theory, it shows the nice separation, exponential divergence of trajectories. But yeah, I mean that's okay if you have the equations in motion. But if you don't, is it, is it fair to say that um, your your continuous arch? Your success there is the fact that it's pretty much behaving like a single degree of freedom system. Yeah, yeah. Because I mean, for example, if you had taken a really steep it arch, it would be asymmetric. You'll, right? you'll yeah. get these guys yeah. going as well as. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So this is a shallow arch. Right, right. Uh, and also, if you noticed, it was mounted on a, sh a shaker, a yeah. huge 500 pound shaker. So it's inertial loading, which tends to promote that sort of symmetric snap through. So it is one degree of freedom like. Right. So it's not terribly surprising. That, but still, I mean, you know, it's still, I didn't expect the correspondence to be that good. I mean, maybe you don't even need a finite element. You just need a one mode approximation or something. Yeah, I mean, that, that was what you, you would start with for sure. Mm -hmm. uh, that was, well, I was going to say it's funded by the Air Force, but this has been video recorded. So. <laughs> Be careful what I say. <laughs> Paul, just uh, perhaps you could clarify a little bit. Suppose I've got my experimenter's hat on and yeah. I've got all this data and I don't know the Lyapunov uh, exponent uh, charge two dimensional plot. Say again a little bit about how sensitive things are to the second threshold. In other words, if I just rolled a die and said take five, six peaks based on the results of the die, how close would I be to the uh, Lyapunov? I mean, how much it, do you have to play with that? No, that's a really good point. N almost not at all. It was almost like every time we tried something, just based on a reasonable, logical guess of a threshold, it worked. Whereas when you try and compute Lyapunov exponents, have, have you done that at all? It's almost like every time you tweak a parameter, you get a different answer. So what I can say is that this is much more robust much less sensitive to, to the changes. The choice of those two thresholds is, is really uh, not critical compared to all the things you have to play with for, to get reasonable re results from the Apple experiments. Yeah, Surpri surprisingly robust. Yeah. Well, it's I an ad hoc criterion, it's heuristic, you know. I'd like to ask you a question. The, the uh, theory of, of chaos, uh, uh, involves uh, a few different kinds of closed form computation uh, associated with people whose name ends in OV, like uh, uh, there's Malnikov, <coughs> um, Shilnikov, there's a calculation, Stitnikov. In each case, uh, one can do a closed form computation based on uh, a perturbation method, really, uh, and you'll get a curve which predicts that on one side of it there will not be any chaos and on the other side there may be chaos. Uh, is there any relationship between those type of computations and the kind of uh, results that you pick up? Yeah, I, I would say, well, so Melnikov really distinguishes between, um, uh, it really predicts uh, fractal basin boundaries, right? it's, and it's a lower bound. And it's it's okay to, I mean, the theory is relatively straightforward for something simple like Dutton's equation. But I'd argue that for some of these equations of motion, even though they are a single degree of freedom or, 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 or relatively simple, I, don't, I think it would be very tough to apply Melnikov. Um, but, but this whole approach is really based on data. So I think there is relationships. You know, I mean, these, these methods you, you talk about do divide phase space or 
parameter space into areas where chaos is, is likely or possible, um, which this does as well, but this is primarily for data, experimental data. Is, you know, if you've got the equations in motion, you can do a lot more. But, um, yeah. This may be a chance to talk about I, I agree with you, but okay. <laughs> you have another question over there. Yes, please. Um, You have to speak louder. We yeah, can't hear you. Uh, sorry, I was just wondering if, if you think the in, even Paul Jason scale, the situation when the spectral metric is scale, whether there's any change there, whether you have any visualization of it. No, All right. it, it hasn't failed. That's not to say that there there are examples, but so numerically, you know what. Uh, for the pendulum and the Lorenz system. And okay, they're both low order. But you know, the pendulum is periodically externally forced and Lorenz I is not. Uh, but then experimentally, they were all s pretty much low order single degree of freedom systems. I really should try it for that rolling ball on the surface because that has a five dimensional phase space, but I think it would work there. So, you know, I just reiterate, all the results so far have been sort of surprisingly positive. You know, the choice of thresholds was straightforward. Generating the FFTs is, is easy. I mean, we do this in, in linear dynamics all the time. Um, and, you know, at least a few examples, we tried it on both numerically and experimentally. It seemed to just work. I, you know, I, maybe I should look for a counterexample. <laughs> Right? And then that, that would give some additional insight into the, to the way things work. But so far, it's worked just fine. Alex has a question. So I maybe to continue this, there is a word heuristic here, and it certainly has a very heuristic quality, the, the, the way you present the method. Right? There are two parameters. You told us that you can reasonably select any gas for those thresholds. It seems to work. But there must be, if it works so broadly, there must be a theorem working somewhere. You have to discover it here. Yeah. So what would you like that theorem to state to remove the word heuristic from it? Yeah, that, yeah. I, I probably need a collaborator who <laughs> <laughs> who's a theoretician who could, yeah. I, um, yes, it cannot be a coincidence to work so well in so many examples. Yeah, but it's, it's just, the, it, yeah, heuristic, ad hoc, it's just something that seems to work. Uh, it is related to the other question, though. I mean, it may not always work. A lot of my mechanical systems are well behaved in the sense that the, they're very often periodically excited, you know, so that sort of perhaps forces some relatively simple structure onto the behavior, but yeah, I, I don't think I can really answer that. <laughs> Good question. <laughs> well, seeing no other question, let, let's uh, thank the speaker, and uh, you're all invited to join him and uh, each other for refreshments.